Uh, we'll read you a brief notice concerning the COVID-19 provisions that we've made in our procedure. Due to the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis, and in accordance with Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, the Zoning Board of Adjustment is authorized to meet electronically. The City of Concord will be using the Zoom platform for this electronic meeting. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to the meeting, which was authorized pursuant to Governor Sununu's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and, if necessary, participate in this meeting by following the following link. That is slash forward slash forward slash US 02 web dot zoom dot US slash J slash 61091931818. Or dialing the following number and entering the following ID number at the prompt. The telephone number is one nine two nine two zero five six zero nine nine and the webinar ID is six one zero nine one nine three one eight. Please enter your full name when logging in so attendance and minutes can properly be recorded. Note that the telephone participation will be enabled at the end of each public hearing. All participants keep your phones and computers on mute unless speaking, please. Members of the public can also email questions or other public testimony to code, C-O-D-E, at concordnh.gov, and staff will read the testimony or question into the record during the meeting. Any member of the public can also call the code administrative office during the meeting at 603-856-3913. And if they're unable to access the meeting and if assistance is with connected is needed, they can secure that through calling that number. Materials can be requested from the uh, code office, code administration division, uh, zoning office via email, or by calling and leaving a message at 603-225-8580. Or meeting agendas and links to the cases can be accessed at forward slash forward slash www.concordnh.gov slash 280, that's 280 slash zoning dash board dash of dash adjustment. We will be hearing, I don't believe we have anything but variances this evening. Uh, we have one other question, which is a determination of regional impact. Uh, we will follow our usual procedure, which is to say we will call the cases with one exception in the order in which they appear on the agenda and ask the appellants to come forward and be sworn in and offer any testimony that they would like us to hear in support of their appeal. We request that if at all possible, they can find their testimony to 10 minutes. We will then solicit testimony from anyone in the audience who is in favor of the appeal and following that anyone in the audience who is in opposition to the appeal. We request that those, testify, those people testifying from the audience can find their testimony, if at all possible, to five minutes each. Uh, following the public testimony, we will check in with code enforcement to see if there's any further information coming forth from their office. And then if any testimony has been offered that seems to bear factual clarification, the appellant will be offered the opportunity to provide that clarification, not new arguments, prior to our closing the public testimony portion of the hearing. Under most circumstances, the board will act on each case prior to moving on to the next one in the agenda. Now, the first case we're going to hear this evening is case 1821, and the reason for that is that uh, the Applicant is requesting a, an industrial uh, to construct or remodel an industrial building over an aquifer. This requires uh, a determination on the part of the board, and the applicant has also requested that we then 
table the uh, ap appeal so that it can be heard uh, or recess the appeal so that it can be heard next month when uh, counsel for the appellant is available. So uh, the case is 1821 Laura Hartz Esquire for 3G Eagle LLC. The applicant wishes to renovate an existing industrial building into three industrial flex tenant units with an automotive repair facility, which is principally used J four and five as a tenant and requests, oh, as a tenant and requests a variance to article 2836 aquifer protection district section D3 uses prohibited item N automotive repair, servicing or automotive body work to permit such automotive repair, service and body work, whereas such use is not allowed for a property located in at 25 Henniker Street in an R uh, in an IN industrial district with an aquifer protection district APD overlay on a portion of the property. And I'm going to ask Craig to before I invite the uh, appellants to step forward to fill us in a little bit on the details of uh, the determination that we're being asked to make. Or not. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure the appellants are here or not. They like say they weren't necessarily planning. Have they not planning. emerged? No, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if they were planning to be in attendance for this part of it since uh, it's really most of the board. So here, let me share a screen with you. Um, So this is the subject property here, um, number 25 Henniker Street. And the hashed outline area here is the Aquifer Protection District. So the, pur the purpose of the um, determination of regional impact is so that if there's anything proposed within one municipality that would have an effect on an adjacent municipality, um, they'd be given uh, opportunity, uh, public notice, so that they could come and speak and respond to. And it's, uh, you yeah, know, we have to send a notice to the affected municipality as well as a regional planning commission. And so here, here, here's what we have. Uh, you, you have the aquifer up here. Um, it doesn't show on the Pembroke side of the thing. The Pembroke wellheads are down here just to the north of what would be Manchester Street where it crosses the Sukuk River. And even though we don't carry our GIS over into Pembroke, the aquifer lines pretty much continue in a spanning you know, line coming down towards the low point, I believe, over in here, where you know the well heads are all located. Um, so that's all in Pembroke. And it's all on the other side of the boundaries. Um, so then, the, I think this this is one that you know could reasonably be uh, anticipated to have a regional impact where it could affect the drinking water for the community. Craig, is that a is that an RSA that requires us to make this determination, or is that just like a, co a compact between the towns? No, nope, it's a state RSA thirty six, I believe it is. Yes. Just thirty six. It's a uh, thirty six. I think it's fifty four. Thanks. So. The reason for this request, and we have encountered this before, I think in the same neighborhood. Yeah, you had the Banks Chevrolet up on um, Manchester Street several years ago, and I believe the one for Integra Drive came before you before they withdrew their case on that, that one. So. And the appellant requires, is it a variance from the board or is it? It'll be a variance to permit uh, the automotive repair and service work um, of, over the aquifer, well, within the aquifer protection overlay district. So the criteria for deciding whether or not we think it has a regional impact, which is to say whether or not we should notify Pembroke, essentially is whatever the board it, thinks it, on the basis it, of its it, common knowledge. Hey, Craig, well, if you'll so stop sharing your screen, I can read it. I actually have it pulled up. Great. And 
And the Regional Planning Commission has offered some written um, guidance on it too, which basically says if there's any question whatsoever, it should be determined uh, DRI. Right. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Laura. So it's um, the relative size or number of dwelling units, which obviously isn't an issue here, proximity to the borders of a neighboring community, which is transportation networks, anticipated emissions such as light, noise, smoke, odors, or particles. And here's the big one, proximity to aquifers or surface waters, which would transcend municipal boundaries and shared facilities such as schools and solid waste. Okay. Now they are required, Craig, as I understand it, from reading their application to take uh, various measures to ensure that any toxic substances that might get into the water supply are contained. Yeah, and that's all defined within our ordinance. Um, you know, the amounts of hazardous materials they may keep in containers, limited amounts, you know, like five gallons, and then, you know, what really re they, they cannot keep. And then they have uh, lists of uses that are not permitted, and the automotive repair facility falls within those lists. Uh, I don't believe I recall a case where we were asked to make a determination without hearing from the appellant. Uh, they, they have submitted it in writing or, you know, in discussion with me. So, um, it, he, and I'm not sure if he's, yeah, he's not here, but yeah, no, I think, um, I thought they were going to be here. There must've been uh, some confusion, but uh, there's no reason you can't proceed without them. I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion to provide the notice because the, the only, it, it, they would only be arguing against it. So they, they give up their right to argue against the notice, but it doesn't. Oh, no, no, no. I think he's talking about the, uh, people representing the appellant. The, right. I think that's what talking about too. They, oh, they yeah, only, yeah. If they wanted to show up and argue that they shouldn't get the notice, they could come. They obviously. Yeah. Oh, they're in agreement. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. So, and, and frankly, it seems like a pretty low threshold to make the decision. And since it's an aquifer district to me, it seems, it seems pretty straightforward. They, that we just should provide Pembroke the notice. And if they want to take a position, then they could come to the next hearing. All right. Uh, it's been moved. Is there a second for that motion? I second it. Is there further discussion on the motion? It seems the cautious thing to do, um, and it gives Pembroke a chance, if they have any interest in this case, to speak up on the subject. Um, I just, I should disclose that my firm represents the town of Pembroke, but they've not contacted me at all about this issue. I didn't know that this was going to be an issue tonight. Well, I, if you don't consider it to be a conflict of interest, then... Not yet. All right. <laughs> If, if we all excused ourselves from every case where we knew somebody, we'd mm -hmm. be here. All right, we have a motion uh, on the table and a second. I'm going to pull the board, starting with Mr. Walner. Aye. And Ms. Beckner Morgan. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Winters. Aye. And I also vote aye. <laughs> uh, I would also like to hear a motion to adjourn the meeting until. Well, I guess we have to, is there a time limit, Craig, on when, how long Pembroke would have to respond? Yes. I mean, we, we have to notify them 20 days, I think, prior to the, the public hearing. So, yeah, the re recessing to the May 7th or May 5th um, zoning board meeting would be uh, the, the, the preferred um, action. All right. Do I hear a motion to that effect? So moved. Is there a second? Second. I'll start the voting poll then. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Winters. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Ms. Becker Morgan. Aye. And I also vote aye. So the uh, hearing is adjourned and we will go back then to the top of our agenda this evening which is case 1121, Bob Harbor. The applicant wishes to construct a 10 by 12 foot two-story addition, 240 square feet plus or minus, on an existing non-conforming residence and requests a variance to article 2884C1, expansion of a non-conforming non use 
to allow the expansion of a non to allow of a non-conforming. I speak English as my native language, but occasionally <laughs> I lack fluency. I think there's a glitch in here. Anyway, expansion of a non-conforming use to allow the expansion of a non-conforming use where each use, where such use is not permitted for property located at nine Broken Bridge Road in an IN industrial district. I, I think we all understand what we're being asked to consider. Uh, is there someone here, is Mr. Harbor here? Or is there someone here representing him? Uh, you're fine, go ahead. I'm here. I'm Bob Harbor, I'm here. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, Mr. Harbor? Absolutely. Would you fill us in on the details of why you believe a variance is appropriate in this case? Um, I'm getting older. My daughter and her husband have agreed to move in to help me in my elder years. The house is not that big, and it would really help to allow us to have a full bathroom upstairs and um, larger uh, enlarge the bathroom downstairs in the bedroom. Um, oh no! So. That's the reason for the. And why are they in violation here, Craig? Is it because the use itself a house isn't permitted? Went the wrong way there. Uh, yeah, the property lies within um, an industrial zone. Um, I can just bring that up here. So the house is located on this lot right here and all the gray area that you see is all industrial. Um, down at the end of Broken Bridge Road, there's a great deal uh, owned by the gas company. They have their training facility here, testing facilities, fuel things, and um, yeah, piping systems and collection systems. So. Yeah, it, it, it's very much industrial down here. And these are just uh, two of the last residential uses that are accessed off of uh, Broken Bridge Road. Okay, thank you. Is there anything else you'd like us to know, Mr. Harbor? Well, I I mean, I don't see a, see when I per when when the house was built, it was a residential neighborhood, and the gas company's building across the street wasn't even here when I bought the house. I'm just asking to put a small. It's going to have absolutely no impact on anybody except a great benefit for me. Uh, um, I worked hard to own a home in Concord, and um, I would just like this small concession so that I could continue to live in my home that I paid for. Are there any questions from the board? Anyone? Thank you very much, Mr. Harbor. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition to it? All quiet. Uh, was there someone who wanted to be heard? No, sir. Everything's quiet. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll, is there anything, a uh, comment from code enforcement? No, I don't have anything additional to add to this. Okay, thank you. With that, we'll close the public testimony portion of the hearing. We have a request for a variance to add a bathroom on the first and second floor of an existing house. We heard testimony that the house has been overtaken by events in that it's in a zone that it wasn't, was not intended um, for residential use, but it was built before that zone was established. Do we have uh, any thoughts on this? How about you, Nick? 
Well, you know, looking at the uh, the plans and so forth, if, if this was in a residential area, uh, they wouldn't come to us because they meet all the criteria in terms of setbacks and everything else. Um, I think the hardship uh, has developed over the years because of the changing conditions of the district. So I'm inclined to approve this. Andrew. Yeah, I agree. I think if they, you know, if they wanted, if it was a large addition or a real increase in the use, but it's pretty minor and it's really just supplementing the use that's already been in existence, I think it would be, I think it would be unreasonable for us to deny you know, this pretty modest change. Yeah. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think the um, um, the property was overtaken by uh, um, changes to the the um, the zoning of it, so it's a a condition not created by the owner. So I'm I'm perfectly fine with it. Or I agree. I think this is uh, as close to a natural expansion of a non-conforming use as you can get. So I have no issues with granting this variance. I also agree with my colleagues and support a motion to approve. Is there such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? I think I heard a dog somewhere back there. Sorry, that was me. Somebody came into my house unexpectedly. Ah, I, I thought perhaps he had something he wanted to say. <laughs> Not at the moment. Oh, okay. All right, let's take a vote then, starting with Ms. Spector Morgan. Aye. Uh, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Winters. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The variance is approved. Thank Thanks. you. You're welcome. That brings us to our second case this evening, case 1221, William Young. The applicant wishes to establish the subject property as a buildable lot and requests a variance of Article 2841B, minimum lot size, and Article 2841H, the table of dimensional regulations, to permit the development of a property with 10,000 square feet of land where the minimum lot size required is 12,500 square feet of land. For property located at 13 Drew Street, that is map block 603-Z146-, slash slash, in an RS residential single family district. Is Mr. Young here or is someone representing him? Good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the board, John Arnold from Hinkley App Allen. I represent uh, the applicant, uh, William Young Properties. I believe uh, Mr. Young is on the video as well. Very good. You swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Why don't you fill us in on why you believe a variance is appropriate here? Thank you. Um, so the uh, the property here, I, I don't know, Craig, are you able to pull up a, a GIS shot of it or anything like that just to get oriented? Thank you. Yeah, so here's the, that's the lot right there. Drew Street running north and south, Chase Street running east and west. And as I said, that's the subject lot here. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> so the um, you can see the property is located at the corner of Drew Street and Chase Street. It's a it's a square property, uh, roughly uh, 100 feet by 100 feet, total of 10,000 square feet for the lot area. The um, the minimum lot size per today's zoning is 12,500 square feet. So the property is just barely shy of that, uh, 2,500 square feet. Uh, the property has a somewhat complicated history beginning in the 1940s when the prior owners, uh, the Donaghy family, uh, first purchased it. And at that time, um, the minimum lot size was 8,000 square feet. So the lot was a, a legal conforming lot. Um, in 1999, uh, Mrs. Donaghy passed away and her son inherited this property and also the adjacent property to the north, um, which is 11 Drew Street. And at that point in time, uh, the zoning ordinance uh, had been amended and the minimum lot size had, had increased to 12,500 square feet. So the law was a pre-existing non-conforming lot at that point. Um, also at that time, the zoning ordinance had a provision which provided that any non-conforming lot in common ownership uh, with an adjacent lot would be automatically merged into a single lot. So, um, when Mr. Donaghy uh, inherited this property in 1999, 
uh, he was unaware of that provision, and he, shortly after inheriting it, uh, sold off the, the house lot, 11 uh, Drew Street, that is a house on it right there. And a few years later, he sought to build on the subject property that we're here about tonight. Um, and at that point, the city advised him that because the lots had been automatically merged in 99, uh, they'd become a single a single lot at that point, and he didn't have any right to sell uh, 11 Drew Street separately. Um, so his conveyance of 11 Drew Street um, in 99 constituted an illegal subdivision, and the subject lot uh, no longer had any pre-existing non-conforming status because it had, it had been merged with the 11 uh, Drew Street property and then illegally subdivided in 99. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Donaghy, in, in 2004, applied to this board for a variance from the lot size requirement uh, based on that involuntary merger and, and then subsequent uh, subdivision, but the board denied the request on a narrow uh, three to two margin. Um, the property sat vacant since that time. Mr. Young, uh, tonight's ap applicant, uh, bought the property in 2010, and now he's just seeking to put a, a single family home on it. Uh, as you know, the threshold um, matter to hear this application tonight is whether there's been a material change in circumstances since the 2004 application. Um, the most significant change since that time is the enactment of a, a couple of statutes regarding involuntary mergers. In 2010, uh, the legislature amended RSA 67439A uh, to prohibit involuntary mergers and prevent municipalities from merging lots without the consent of the lot owner. Uh, and then in 2011, the legislature enacted RSA 67439AA, uh, which requires municipalities to separate lots that were involuntary, involuntarily merged by operation of zoning. Um, so had, had these statutes been in effect back in 99, the outcome likely would have been much different because uh, had the lots never been merged, the subject property would have retained its pre-existing non-conforming status and the 2004 application wouldn't have been clouded by the idea that the owner had illegally subdivided the property and created this non-conformity. Um, additionally, there, there have been some clarifications and refinements to the, um, the variance criteria since 2004, specifically the public interest and substantial justice criteria, which also weigh in favor of uh, hearing this request. So um, these changes in the law, coupled with the passage of nearly 17 years uh, since the last application, we believe constitute a material change in circumstances, um, warranting a, uh, a new review of this application. And I'm happy to pause at this point, Mr. Chair, if you want to have a discussion or a vote on that point before I proceed to the variance criteria, but I'll do what you please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Arnold. I think perhaps we ought to. Uh, members of the board, do you have thoughts on uh, whether or not this consists of uh, essentially meets the criteria for a new a new hearing. Ms. Spector Morgan? I do. Um, in 2010, the unnecessary hardship criteria were substantially changed by the legislature. So I think between 2004 and 2021, there's been a material change in the law. Mr. Monahan? I agree. Mr. Winters? So it's, it's I, I guess this is a question for, for Ms. Spector Morgan and, and, and or Mr. Arnold. Is that, so you're saying basically after that decision, any variance can, can be reviewed or, or would it have to be that the original zoning board decision might have been different? In other words, some zoning board decisions are gonna be so obvious that when, when the new court decision will make a ruling, it can't mean every single possible decision can be, can be reviewed again. I think it does. There's actually a Supreme Court case out there, Brandt Development, that talks about how not only was the unnecessary hardship criteria tweaked, but between 2004 and now, there have also been um, judicial reinterpretations of the other variance criteria. Um, you'll recall back in 2004, we had use variances and dimensional variances, and now we only have one variance. So I, I think... Honestly, you'd be hard pressed to find a variance application from the 2002, 2004 timeframe that you couldn't rehear now. Interesting. Mr. Waller. Uh, yes. Andrew, I'm not sure you've got a chance to, you asked a question. I think I may have skipped over your answer. No, I didn't. I was kind of processing the information. I, I saw that Brandt case. It may be academic because I'll, I'll take Mr. Arnold's word for it that that 
quote, cloud of impropriety might have been a factor in the 2004, uh, maybe impropriety is not the word, that cloud of may have been a, a factor. So I think probably regardless, I, I inclined to agree we should hear the case now. Very well. Would someone care to make a motion? I move that we find that this is a materially different application and hear the case. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any discussion? All right, I'll uh, pull the board. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mr. Winters? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Yes. And Ms. Spectrum Morgan? Aye. And I also vote aye. We will hear, proceed to hear the request for a variance. Mr. Arnold? Thank you. Um, Craig, can I impose on you one more time to pull back up the, the GIS or the tax map list? Wait. Oh, spot. <laughs> yeah, that looked pleasant. I like that. There we go. Stoddard, New Hampshire. <laughs> ah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> maybe if you can zoom out one click, Craig, just to see some more of the properties on that block. Um, uh, with with respect to the um, the public interest criteria, th there won't be any change in the central character of the neighborhood or the impact of public health, safety, or welfare. The reason I wanted to take a look at the, the GIS map is just to show that th this neighborhood was developed initially in the early 1900s, and um, it's, it's really defined by small house lots. You can see that they all, for the most part, have a depth of 100 feet, and then they vary to some extent with the amount of frontage, but they're all small square and rectangular lots. The, the block that this property is on has two other lots that have the same dimensions on them, uh, 100 by 100, 10,000 square feet that are already developed with houses on them. And several other developed lots uh, <coughs> near this property are even smaller. Some are less than 5,000 square feet. Uh, just across the street, there's one on the corner. Um, and then a little bit further up Drew Street, there's, there's two more. Um, so putting a house on this lot will be consistent with the character of the, uh, the neighborhood. On the substantial justice and the spirit of the ordinance, uh, this situation arose in, in large part due to a, a number of unintended consequences back in 1999 when Mr. Donaghy inherited the two adjacent properties and the zoning automatically merged them. Uh, while it's true that the spirit of the ordinance is to maintain um, minimum lot sizes for purposes of separation and, and density and space, uh, the spirit also seeks to allow landowners to put their property to some reasonable uses. Uh, we aren't proposing here to create a new substandard lot, which uh, may understandably cause more angst, um, but instead we're simply looking to put a long established lot to a reasonable use uh, consistent with the other house lots in the neighborhood. On the hardship criteria, um, there's a few ways this property is unique. Uh, first, it, it's a corner lot, so it only has two adjacent abutters. Um, both of the adjacent properties exceed the minimum lot size and are already developed. Um, yeah, the property to the, essentially they're right on the screen uh, and the property uh, above, above to the north. So both of those lots are um, larger than the, uh, the 10,000 square foot lot size minimum and they're both developed. Um, so that provides some adequate open space and separation between the immediate abutters and the overall density uh, for the three properties, if it were viewed as a whole, um, would be compliant. Uh, one of the other benefits for uh, being on a corner is that the adjacent streets also provide some separation from neighbors to the south and the west. Uh, this house isn't being tucked in with, you know, a direct abutter on each side. Um, and third, very few, uh, this is one of very few undeveloped lots in this historic neighborhood, and it's just barely shy of the lot size requirement. The difference of 2,500 square feet uh, really won't have much of any impact. Uh, the house is going to be modest in size. It's going to comply with all setbacks and other zoning requirements. And uh, prohibiting the use of this property would be unjust, particularly given that the other surrounding properties in the neighborhood many of which are the same size, many of which are even smaller, uh, have all been developed. Uh, so that's, that's essentially our overview, our presentation. We're happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Yes, Ms. Spectrum Martin. Attorney Arnold, other than developing this property with a house pursuant to this variance, is there any other use that really can be made of the property? I don't believe so, no. 
Thank you. Any other questions from the board? I don't see one stepping forward. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Arnold. And now we'll solicit testimony from anyone in the audience who would like to be heard in favor of this appeal. Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition? Is there any comment from code enforcement? Um, no, I think Mr. Arnold, Attorney Arnold has uh, laid out the history of this uh, very accurate, accurately. Um, I would just say that the city is very supportive of infill development uh, uh, for lots like this. So. Chris, can I get Thank you. Thank you. Chris, Chris, before you go, oh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, there is a letter of support, uh, the last page of the document submitted. Oh, did I overlook it? Well, it's way in the back. Yeah, once you get past the colored pictures, I stop looking. <laughs> we do have an email. This is from Christopher Knight, and he is in support. He he is it's concerning. He's the owner of Six Drew Street, and he is in support of the request for the variance. I believe that was the only communication like that on that app. I'm going to assume that's not the Christmas yes. from the Brady Bunch. <laughs> I didn't know. With that, we'll declare the public testimony portion closed. And I'll invite uh, discussion from members of the board. Ms. Spector Morgan, what are your thoughts on the case? Uh, I am in favor of granting this variance. Uh, the public interest, spirit and intent, and substantial justice um, criteria all, according to the court, really focus on whether the proposed use would be consistent with the neighborhood, and this obviously would. Um, it's not going to diminish surrounding property values and the fact that there is really no other use that can be made of this property, absent a variance, um, speaks to the fact that there is some unnecessary hardship. So I would be in favor of granting the variance. Mr. Monty, your mic is off. Uh, I agree with Laura, Lars, and uh, she also asked a critical question, I think, which is, uh, is there really any other reasonable use of this lot? And uh, I think the answer is no. So I will um, support the request. Mr. Winters. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I, I think it's a relevant factor, at least to me, that there's obviously a very desperate need for new housing in Concord. Um, and it, it'd be such a waste for such a, you know, such a, uh, a lot like this to go to basically just be, be vacant. And although it doesn't quite meet the, the, the lot size requirement, it's, it, the lot is a perfect square, which I think really allows a developer to maximize the use. It doesn't have any like stray corners or odd shapes to it, which are basically wasted space. So, so I agree. Mr. Walter. I agree. Just one thing to note uh, on Drew Street, there are nine lots. Six of them do not conform by today's standards. <clears throat> Very good. I agree with all my colleagues. I think the criteria for a variance are satisfied. Would anyone care to make a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? All right. I'll poll the board members, starting with Ms. Becker Morgan. Aye. And Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Winters. Aye. Mr. Walner, aye. And I also vote aye. The variance is granted. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. That brings us to the next case this evening, which is case 14 21. Eric Stevens, the applicant wishes to expand a commercial indoor recreational facility, principal use C3 established by variance under case 46-2018 and at a residential dwelling and request the following. A variance to article 28.24J, table of principal uses, to allow an expansion of the commercial indoor recreational facility by adding a new detached storage building 
for use in conjunction with the indoor recreation facility and a various to Article 28.24H, multiple principal uses on the same lot, to permit a single family dwelling to be developed on the same lot as an existing non-residential use. The property located at 63 Bog Road, which is transected by an RO residential open space district and an RM residential medium density district. Mr. Stevens, is, are you here or is someone here representing you? Yes, I am. And it's uh, myself, my brother, Justin, and his wife, Jennifer, joining us. Do you swear to tell the truth? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you very much. Why don't you fill us in on why you believe that a variance is appropriate in this case? Okay. Uh, this is Justin starting. Uh, for those that don't know us, uh, my name is Justin. This is my wife, Jennifer. We um, lost. We lost Justin. We cut out for a second. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? We, we. The last word we heard was "wife." Okay. Um, we're the three owners of the barn at Bull Meadow, a wedding and events center, which opened in town last October at 63 Bog Road. Um, first, we want to thank the city for their help in getting our venue open last fall, in spite of a global pandemic and also to the zoning board for granting our previous variance in 2018, which allowed us to make our dream of operating a wedding venue in Concord a reality. In the six months since we opened, we realized that we're lacking in two key areas, storage space and security. What we're requ requesting from the city is approval to construct a 32 foot by 32 foot two-story garage to be used for storage and to, and to allow for a constant presence on the property to ensure security. We need additional storage on the property for a few different reasons. The first is that we lost usable storage space in our building due to changes in utility and HVACs layout, um, which was a cost saving measure that we made to counteract our increased construction costs during COVID-19. We've also had to store many more tables and chairs than anticipated inside of our building because of the COVID-19 guest count limitations and guest spacing requirements. Additionally, we've had much smaller weddings because of COVID-19. So when the weddings are smaller, we need to store all of our extra tables and chairs. We're currently exceeding the capacity of our storage space, forcing us to store items in our bridal suite, as well as outdoors exposed to the elements, as you can see in the image to the right. Thank you for opening that. We have been renting an offsite storage unit to assist with this, and we've been doing that for quite a few months now but it's becoming very impractical to bring tables and chairs back and forth for each event on our personal trailer. Um, this is Jen. Um, we uh, believe that we need an on-site dwelling for two primary reasons, um, and that's a sleeping space as well as the security presence. Uh, on the days that we're hosting events, we work typically 14 plus hours um, and need to be back there the next morning for tours um, or the start of any other events. Um, so driving home after a 14 hour day is not really ideal um, and having a place to stay on site would likely be safer for us and for the public. Um, additionally, Justin and I recently had uh, a baby boy as well. So having a residence on site for our parents to watch uh, our son, while you know we're working, allows for stability and a little bit more time with our new baby. As far as for our security presence, um, since the construction began last spring, we've noticed a frequent presence of uninvited visitors. Sometimes it's just curious neighbors disregarding our trespassing signs. Other times it's walkers and bikers using our private driveway as an access point to the rail trail which runs down the middle of our property. We've witnessed people on our security cameras looking into windows, walking around the barn at all hours of the night, um, which does turn into an issue when we have a lot of our storage outside. Um, the property itself is not visible from the road or from any of our abutters homes, which really limits the ability of the neighborhood to help us keep an eye on our property. Um, we've arrived in the morning sometimes and found broken bottles in the parking lot, um, not, you know, not related to any event that we've ever had. Um, 
but broken bottles, damaged landscaping, um, burnout marks or um, snowmobile tracks, ruts in the driveway. Um, having a constant presence on the property would help mitigate a large amount of the damage and proposed location of the garage is at a point where nearly all uninvited visitors would need to pass in order to get to the rest of the pro and the rest of the property. We have installed multiple signs, cameras, and spoken with dozens of uninvited desk, um, guests, but the intrusions still occur multiple times a day. Um, even during wedding ceremonies, we've had to designate a staff to stand in our driveway to turn people away so that way they don't interrupt a, you know, a private event going on. Eventually, we do plan on installing a driveway gate in the future, but we know this is only going to deter vehicular traffic. Um, and even then, you know, people can still walk down the walk down the driveway on foot past a gate. All right, this is Eric, and um, I'm going to speak about the unnecessary hardship on the property. Um, the first thing I'd like to just talk about is the special conditions and in uh, Rancourt versus the city of Manchester in 2000. The Supreme Court ruled that um, after Simplex versus the town of Newington, a hardship exists when special conditions of the land render the use for which the variance is sought to be reasonable. Our property has a unique shape, specifically its large setback from the road. We have a 1400 foot driveway, uh, which makes it perfectly reasonable to need an on-site security presence. The property is bisected by the rail trail, which essentially provides the public with access to the interior of our lot outside the view of Bog Road or any of our abutters. This also makes reasonable, if not necessary, to grant this variance to allow for enhanced security. Um, there is no fair and substantial relationship um, between the uh, zoning ordinance and what we're requesting. Strict adherence to the established zoning ordinance would not advance the purpose of the ordinance because prior to the granting of our variance in 2018, construction of a single family detached dwelling and a garage would both be allowed within the RO zone. Um, COVID-19 has resulted in a few impacts for us here at the property. It is one um, led to restrictions on the wedding industry, which require increased spacing between guests, which limits the amount of furniture we can place in our reception hall. It has decreased, I'm sorry, decreased the average size of weddings, causing us to need additional storage space. And it has led to unexpected costs and decreased revenue, as well as uncertainty within the wedding industry. Um, and that has kept Justin and I from leaving our full-time careers, which also limits the amount of time we can spend on the property um, performing security or just maintaining a presence. Um, I'm going to speak now to the spirit and intent and public interest. Um, construction of a garage with a single family dwelling above it does not interfere with any of the nine explicitly stated zoning ordinance purposes listed in section 28-1-5 of the Concord Code. In fact, granting this variance would bolster many of those purposes, specifically subparagraphs A, B, G, H, and I. Um, our proposed use of the land would not alter the essential character of the neighborhood, uh, as there are many garages and single family dwellings throughout the neighborhood. Um, the appearance of the garage will fit the physical form and character of the neighborhood, and the exterior of the garage will be aesthetically pleasing and would not appear to be non conforming in either the RO or RM zones. Constructing a garage with a single family dwelling above it poses no readily ev evident threats to the public health, safety, or welfare. In fact, it will be used to help reduce the demand on law enforcement, which in turn will promote public health, safety, and welfare. Um, substantial justice. The existing business on the property is bringing hundreds of visitors into Concord every weekend, and we have and will continue to host the Ward 2 elections annually for the city. We have worked closely with the city to become a benefit to the local area, and theft and trespassing on the property is making that more difficult. Allowing additional storage and on-site premises for the owners will cut down on this and will allow us to spend more time attracting more guests and aiding the community. We already employ some of the neighbors at the uh, business, including a bartender, our landscaper, and our groundskeeper. And granting this variance would allow us to continue hiring necessary staff from the local area. And finally, I'm just going to talk about the impact on the surrounding properties. The proposed location for the garage and apartment is not within eyesight of any of our abutters. Additionally, there will be no excess noise or traffic onto the property once the garage is completed. Construction of the garage will actually prevent unwelcomed visitors in the neighborhood, and there's no reason to believe that adjacent property values will be diminished by the addition of this structure. So in conclusion, 
Thank you all for your time and allowing us to present this request. We hope that you agree that our request is reasonable, not contrary to the spirit and intent of the ordinance or the public interest, will result in substantial justice and would not diminish the value of surrounding properties. Additionally, not granting this variance would result in unnecessary hardship for us and our business, which we believe has already proven to be a valuable addition to our neighborhood and the city of Concord. Thank you. Are there questions from the board? I have a question for Craig. Is that appropriate now? You bet. Craig, um, it looks like in the application, the only reason this requires a variance rather than a special exception is because a variance was originally granted for the use. Is that true? Uh, no, well, in the variance is because in the RO zone, um, you can't have a mixed use. You can't have a okay. you know, residential and commercial together. Okay. Plus, as the original was uh, established by variance, this is now a change in the uh, circumstances surrounding that variance. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, Chris. Yeah. Um, as I recall, when this was before us in the past, uh, this is kind of a uh, wet piece of property. Um, yeah, there is some wetlands on the property. We yeah. have we had to pull have some permits pulled before we started. Mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate any problems with the uh, location of the garage being challenged by these wet spots? Or I mean the the. The part of the reason why we're putting the garage where we are or where we'd like to put it is to avoid the wetlands. Um, we have very few spots on the property that aren't wetlands, um, even though it is almost 34 acres in size. Um, that's part of the reason why we're putting it where we are. And also like Jen mentioned, just so that when, you know, it's at the beginning of the uh, of our developed portion of the property. So we wanna make sure we, can stop uh, intruders before they access everything else. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, thank you. Is there anyone who would like to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition to it? Me. I beg your pardon? I would. Can I speak? Oh, okay. Uh, Did I miss would my... Would you introduce yourself, please? I'm Erin O'Toole. Do you uh, swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. What would you like us to know, Ms. O'Toole? Um, I think this is a case of scope creep. I think um, this could result in a huge enterprise. They're just trying to do it step by step. And I'm not buying the COVID um, excuse. I think it's lack of planning on their part, not foreseeing the need for storage space and security. And um, that's it. I think it's scope creep. It's going to develop into something far bigger. Uh, where, where is your property relative to theirs? Um, I have the rail trail, so I can walk five minutes and be next to them. Okay. Is that Ms. O'Toole's land? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Did you have an address? Uh, yes, 28 Americana Drive. Yeah. And I think it's disruptive to the character of the... Um, the land. It's a wildlife corridor, and now we have people coming in through the rail trail, and they've built a uh, commercial enterprise with um, traffic, and I think they should have anticipated security issues as well as building a storage shed, um, putting in a residential home. Um, what's going to happen five years from now? A pool, a tennis court, um, you know, under the auspices of a wedding venue, I can just see it getting bigger and bigger. And uh, that's it. Have you, Ms. O'Toole, since they've been operating, have you, have you noticed it, any issues with like noise or, you know, traffic or any concrete disturbances? Um, as 
far as concrete disturbances, I've walked the trail and I've heard the party guests. Um, I don't monitor traffic. I only go out there, you know, um, every other day. So you can hear it when you walk the trail? Yes. If there's a wedding, okay. Yes, and I, I observed them having a wedding, um, I think it was a week ago, and uh, it wasn't uh, socially distanced, and um, yeah, I could hear it. I can just see this getting bigger and bigger, and I think that's what they're doing. Would you be able to hear it from your home, like if you were inside, do you think, if they had a wedding? If I was inside, probably not. If I was outside, uh, noise carries. It travels. And it is a, it is a um, they call it Bog Road for a reason. So, I, you know, they don't have, what did, what did he say, 36 acres. But not all of it is buildable. But I doubt that. I doubt that. Um, my issue is with scope creep. I think <laughs> lack of planning on their part, they should be anticipated. The need for a storage unit. They just didn't want to put it in the plans the first time around. And um, Ms. So Otto, I think we've covered that ground. Is there something else you'd like us to know? No, I've said it all. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, Ms. Spectre Morgan. I have actually another question for Craig. <laughs> okay. Does the garage actually require any relief or is it just the accessory apartment? Uh, the garage, the storage building, it is an expansion of the use. Of the use so permitted by variance. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Mr. Mr. Chair, you have two letters in support. I, I, I do. You're correct. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to be heard in opposition? I do have two letters. One is from Raymond Mercier, who is at 81 Bog Road, and he abuts the property. He's in favor of granting the variances. He has... Uh, he cites some of the other characteristics or events that um, the appellant mentioned in terms of problems with security and trespassing and whatnot. He indicates that there's substantial area available to build a residence on the property, and he sees a hardship. I also have a letter here from Mr. Timothy Blagden, who lives uh, well, he gives a P.O. box number from Warner, but he's a uh, board president of the Friends of Concord Lake Sunapee Rail Trail, which is the trail that goes through the property. He's writing in support of the request to construct the uh, garage and apartment in the case that he is on the board of the trail, which crosses the property. There's always a flow of people, uh, but the driveway is long. Main function facility can't be seen from the road. He's found the owners to be dedicated and professional. He believes that the garage will benefit their operation. The organization works hard to be an outstanding neighbor. And that's it for the mail, I believe. Any comments from code enforcement? No, I think uh, pretty much everything's been covered here. So if you have any additional questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. All right. Mr. Stevens, would you like to offer any factual clarification in response to anything you've heard? I, I think the only thing I'd like to say, um, we didn't, you know, we don't, we didn't own the property yet when we had the variance hearing the first time. We didn't realize um, the amount of traffic down the rail trail. The other thing is the rail trail was expanded last year. Um, there was no way to know back in 2018 that there was going to be this much traffic onto the interior of our property back then. Um, so, it, I mean, it, it was hard to anticipate the, that we would need anywhere near the amount of security. I mean, we have 18, 20, you know, people onto the property a day that aren't are uninvited. It's, it's, we've counted that many in a single day. It's not one or two a week. It's, it's so. I think that's that's all we have. Yeah, and there's very much project creep as well. Um, you know, this is our first large commercial venture. I don't foresee many more for us, um, but we're learning as we go. But I don't foresee us needing much more on the property beyond this. I think we'll be very content um, with this. We're learning as we go. 
Thank you very much. With that, we'll close the public testimony portion of the hearing. We've heard testimony that the uh, owners of the property have considered the size and obscurity of the interior of the lot to be a special characteristic of the land. And they have testified that uh, they feel that a, a residential use for security purposes, purposes is an important part of um, operating the business, which they do there under variance. Mr. Walner, what do you think? Well, I think um, certainly not granting the variance uh, would be, I think, contrary to the public interest. I think the spirit of the ordinance is going to be observed. Um, I think the hardship, um, I think I'm persuaded with the argument that there's been increased traffic that wasn't anticipated um, on the rail trail. And I think uh, that's going to continue to grow. There's certainly a great interest around the state of New Hampshire on rail trail development. So I'm inclined to be persuaded by the security argument and requiring some on-site accommodations to meet that. Mr. Wetters. Can I, can I ask another question to Craig? And I, I apologize, I might be making you repeat yourself, but I was kind of digesting. Is the, in, in terms of variance two for the single family dwelling, they could, if they, that would be allowed as a matter of right. The only reason why they need this variance is because they want to put it on while there's also a, com uh, a commercial use at the same time. Is that the reason for this variance? Pretty much, yeah. The, the, the ordinance um, prohibits um, more than one, anything other than a single family dwelling on a residential lot um, in, in these districts. And yeah, they say the, the, the use was created by variance, um, essentially replacing um, a, the single family uh, okay. use at that, that time. And then, so now to put the fam single family dwelling on there, yeah, yeah, we need the variance then to allow more than one principal use to exist on the property. And what, what's, I'm just curious, what's the rationale for that? Is it just sort of a, is it, 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 it's segregation of uses. Um, it, you know, for the most part, a commercial use is not overly compatible with residential uses. If your neighbor started running a landscaping contracting company from his property with people coming and going all day and having equipment, that becomes you know, very um, uh, uh, and disruptive for the, you know, the use and enjoyment of property. So, you know, it, it goes along with that aspect of it. So. Could, could they, so, is there some use short of a principal residential use that they could say, put up some sleeping quarters or a kitchen there that they could use if they had, you know, had a really long day, but it wouldn't be their principal use or is it sort of all or nothing? It's either, it's either a, a, a home or it's not a home. Correct. I mean, if if they're creating a dwelling, um, you know, which is self-contained and provides, you know, living, sleeping, eating, food preparation, and sanitary facilities. Are there any other questions from the board? No. Andrew, did you uh, have any thoughts on this project? So, to me, putting aside the whole mission creep or scope creep, I mean, that's, I'm not going to try to read their mind. If Sometimes that, it doesn't, in terms of variance one, that seems pretty consistent with the use that we'd originally allow, allowed. Um, I'm honestly still trying to wrap my head around variance two. Um, you know, they've represented one thing. I'm not. I'm not down the representation, but obviously, if we grant it, that could be somebody living there year round and just making it a house. Um, but on the other hand, is there is something unique about this property that's pretty far away? The segregated use issue isn't probably going to bother anybody but them. So I'm inclined to support too, but I'm a little bit, I wouldn't mind hearing other people's thoughts on that one. Mr. Monaghan. Yeah, just in order, I'm perfectly fine with one. I think the extra sword space probably helps uh, um, uh, keep the property in orderly and, and uh, in good shape. Um, I think the adding the uh, um, the resident space aren't persuaded about the security issue. Um, I also think it's in keeping with the character of that portion of Barg Road. It wouldn't be unusual to see a, uh, a residence there. 
I'm also reminded of the fact that in recent years, uh, we had a similar security issue where we allowed a residential um, um, dwelling on Hall Street as part of a um, storage facility um, for the same types of security reasons. So um, I'm uh, comfortable with approving both one and two. Inspector Morgan. Um, I agree that the storage space is sort of a no-brainer. I think if they'd asked for that with the first variance, the board probably would have granted it. As for the residential use, Andrew, I think I can help you because it is so rare that we have a case actually on point in New Hampshire. And in this case, we do. And I'm actually looking at a, a, a website right now and your smiling face is smiling at me, Andrew, from the website as well as from the Zoom meeting. But it's the U-Haul case from 1982 out of Concord. And in that case, the owners wanted to put an apartment over um, the garage facility for these exact reasons, for security, and because it was 20, sort of a 24-7 business. And the Supreme Court held that it would be an unnecessary hardship to deny that variance, and that granting the variance would do substantial justice. So I'm inclined to agree and grant both variances. I would condition the residential variance on it being occupied only by the owners of the property. Very good. I'm inclined, inclined to agree with my colleagues. I think the uh, configuration and uh, location of the property both helped create a hardship. And I think the reasonable uh, use criteria is, uh, criterion is met with uh, um, the house being there primarily for security reasons. The storage, simply an extension of an already approved use. Uh, with that. Well, uh, could I just uh, make, make, make one comment here though? And uh, Laura, I, you know, I appreciate <laughs> your, your reasons for putting that restriction on there, but it is you know, relatively impossible to enforce. Um, but, you know, a, a request or rec con con uh, condition that it be occupied by employees of the um, property, I, I think would be uh, legitimate and easily enforceable. Thank you. Yes, that makes sense. Thank you, Craig. With that, I'll solicit uh, Before, motion from- I apologize. I thought I heard the um, the applicant say that it might be a family member or parents or something that are potentially living there to help care for the children. So I'm not sure that I'm even comfortable with the requirement that it be a employee. Well, I have no problem with family members using it sort of during events to watch the baby, which is, is what we heard. But okay. to the extent that anyone's going to be living there, if we're approving it for security reasons, I think it needs to be someone related to the business somehow. Very good. Would that include if somebody had, as a part of their condition of living there, had some caretaker responsibilities? Is that, yeah. 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 Would anyone for, make a motion? Just, well, I was gonna say just for the record, you know, where after that case that Laura read, um, we did implement a caretaker um, apartments and allow them in uh, industrial zones and a couple of commercial zones. And in those cases, yeah, it, it is for resident caretakers. So, uh, but there's no restriction on who can be that resident caretaker. So, okay, resident yeah. caretaker works for me. Is that just not permitted in this district, or are we back to the mixed use thing? Uh, it's not a permitted use in the RO district, okay. correct? And it's accessory use in the IN district too. So. Thank you. I'm desperate to solicit a motion. I've tried several <laughs> times here. Failed every time. Would anyone care to make a motion with or without conditions? I move that we approve both variances with the condition that the residential unit be occupied only by a residential caretaker. Very good. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any further discussion? All right, I'll pull the board, starting with Ms. Spector Morgan. Aye. And Mr. Monahan. Aye. And Mr. Winters. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And I also vote aye. Both variances are granted. Thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us to case 1521, Christopher Galbraith. 
The applicant wishes to construct a 20 by 40 foot addition on the westerly side of an existing single family dwelling and requests a variance to Article 2841H, Table of Dimensional Regulations, to allow a setback of not less than 13 feet from the westerly side lot line, where a side setback of 40 feet is required for property located at 79 West Parish Road in an RO residential open space district. Note, the property was granted an equitable waiver in 2001 under case 6 ought one to allow a setback of 33 feet from the westerly side lot line where a 40 foot side setback is required. Is Mr. Galbraith here with us this evening? I am. Good evening, Mr. Galbraith. Do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. Would you fill us in on why you feel a variance is appropriate here? Yes. Uh, so I bought this property about three and a half years ago, knowing that uh, the properties are pretty narrow. Uh, I have just under six acres. Um, I did not realize until set, sending in this variance that my house was already granted a variance when it was built. So that was news to me. So that's why I was looking for 20 feet originally and then found out I, it was already seven feet over. Um, when I bought the property, it has a two bedroom um, in-law and I actually had intended on using that space on the left side of my house to uh, reconstruct inside of my house. But since then we've moved my mother-in-law in and that's constitutes about 850 square feet. So with a growing family, three boys, uh, our kitchen is about 10 by 11. So looking to put a 20 by 40 family room, living room off to the right side of my house, looking at it right there where the arrow's at. Um, it's really the only spot that I can put it. I, if I go out front, I have my septic system. If I go out back, we have full patio and um, some other stuff. And then the right is the parking area where you get into the garage. So really left with just that one area to put it. Uh, looking to reconfigure inside of my house, making a bigger kitchen after that piece is done. So um, I've talked to my neighbor, Art Ellison, and he has no objections to uh, me going to his side of the house. Um, so I'm trying to keep it short and sweet for you guys. I know it's getting late, but uh, that's really what we're looking to do is we're not going to have any impact. If anything, it's going to improve home values, uh, just making our house more valuable. Um, we're not moving anybody in, more people. It's still going to be the same size family. Um, so that's that's what we're looking to do. Mr. Galbraith, where's your well on your property? My well is uh, to right down a little bit with the arrow. Someone can move the arrow down a little. Uh, is it in the backyard? It's in the backyard yeah, to the okay. right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yep. Is the driveway next to which your addition would go, the one that runs up to Mr. Ellison's house? Yes. Okay. Other questions from the board? Is this a two-story addition? Nope, just one story. Um, I could share my screen and show you if you. I think there is a plan on your uh, application. So okay. Rectangle that shows where it would go anyway. I don't know if you can see that now. Yep, that's the so, addition. Yeah, looking to a cathedral ceiling addition and side elevation. Got it, okay. Other questions from the board? All right, thank you very much, Mr. Galbraith. Is there anyone who'd like to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition to it? Any comments from code enforcement? No, I don't have any comments to add on this one. And with that, we'll declare the public testimony portion of the hearing closed. We heard testimony that the uh, lot is unusually narrow and that the uh, owner would like to expand his house to within 13 feet of the property line. He can't expand it pretty much at all without uh, a variance, I believe. Is that true, Craig? Or? Yes. Yeah, the, the, 
the, the property pretty much spans the uh, buildable land area between setbacks already. The house does. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, start with uh, Ms. Spector Morgan. What are your thoughts on this case? Um. I think that given the narrow width of the lot and the location of the house on the lot, the, and given that there is no place to add onto this house without a variance, that there probably is an unnecessary hardship. I think it's not going to diminish surrounding property values and I think substantial justice will be done. Um, with regard to public interest and spirit and intent, you know, the purpose of setbacks is to provide for spacing between structures. And again, given this house's location on the lot and the location of the houses on the abutting lots, that purpose is certainly fulfilled, even if the variance is granted. So I would have no issues granting this variance. Mr. Monaghan. Mike. I think Laura captured it very well. I have nothing to add. Mr. Winters. Yeah, there, it's it's there's still plenty of spaces between the homes, and it, there's and Mr. Ellison's house is so far back. Um, he'll have to drive. He's, he's got to drive by the applicant's house regardless. It's not really going to make much difference for his view. So I, I agree. Mr. Waller. Yeah, for that kind of acreage of this lot, it's an unusual configuration having it as narrow as it is. So I think the hardship uh, argument has been uh, um, well established in my mind. And I concur with my colleagues, one and all. Would anyone care to make a motion? I move that we approve the variance. Is there a second? A second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I'll start this uh, round of voting with Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Winters. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Ms. Spectrum Morgan. Aye. And I also vote aye. The variance is, were there two or one? It was just one. The variance is granted. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That brings us to case 1621, Hamilton and Pamela Munnell. The applicant wishes to construct a second detached dwelling on a single lot and request a variance to Article 2824H, multiple principal uses on the same lot, to permit two single family detached dwellings on a single lot when no more than one detached single family dwelling is allowed on a single lot for property located at 236 South Street in an RS residential single family district. Mr. Mono. Yes. Do you swear to tell the whole truth? I do. Would you fill us in on the details of your request? Sure. Can I can I share my screen? Is that possible? Unfortunately, you can't. <laughs> I can't help you with that, but others can. I think. I think I. Can. Yes, you're perfect. You yes, you, you may you may go ahead. Do you see it? Are you guys? Yes, we do. We do. Okay. Um. So, yep, yeah, we're at 236 South Street. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, so just a little history, uh, what's going on in my my family and uh, what's happened the past year is that my, my mother-in-law passed away in the fall and my father-in-law who's 85 years old is alone. And as a family, we've, we've opted to take him in and have him live with us. And we, we have to try, we have to get him a place to live. Um, so these are the reasons, These all these reasons are listed in the application. I'm just gonna show you the picture of my uh, unit or my, or my lot and kind of talk you through it. So this is um this is my house. And if you see we're kind of where it's kind of we're not in the middle of the, the lot, we're kind of over in the corner. Tough to build that this way, no room here. If we go this way, we have to tear down the, the driveway and the garage. And if we go back, we have to tear up the patio, move the bulkhead and and, and tear up the uh, uh, sunroom. So we really the only place to put it is attached to the garage here where it has plenty of space front. Uh, and side to side, uh, it makes the most sense and, and uh, economically is, is fits our budget. Uh, this is just another shot of our area where uh, looks like it's spring or late summer where the, you can see there's natural borders on both sides of, of my lot. And then this is the uh, plan. So this is the front of the garage 
and the roof will be attached and the whole thing will be attached here. So it says I want to build a um, you know, separate structure. In reality, it's it's going to be attached to my garage, which is attached to my house with a small fence. Uh, you know, we are not, this is going to be for my, my father-in-law. We are never going to rent this property. This will never be a rental. It will only be for my parents uh, in, the, in the future and, and for Barry Gilchrist, my father-in-law, uh, now and he needs a a ground level apartment because um, uh, stairs are not uh, he's not able to do stairs at the moment. Um, this is just a picture of my house how how it is now and so if you can see the architectural structure of it is that we've connected the um, main house to the garage with a little fence and then it will go over here and it'll all be connected and it will look like a single family unit and that and that's in the spirit of the ordinance and. And that's what it's going to look like. We, we care very much about what the property looks like, and and we want to make it look as uh, as a single family unit. And uh, this is just another picture of my backyard. That the things that we would have to destroy in order to build it back here. That's my patio. We just put in about three years ago, and the boat, which has been a, to be honest, a lifesaver in COVID. It's been great. And then the bulkhead would have to be moved, and the sunroom would have to have to go as well. Um, this is just a, a part. This is our another shot of our backyard, and the and the you know this is that's a beautiful tree that we'd have to get rid of, and um, and the, you know we lose the view and, and the back back door backyard out access as as we know it. Uh, so those are the things that I think. Thank you for your time. Uh, I can stop sharing now. I uh, appreciate it. I, I'll keep it short and sweet. But um, the the there's going to be no harm to the community. If we put this up, and the the harm to my family, it, it would be enormous. Uh, my family's really counting on this, so uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who would like to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone who would like to be heard in opposition to it? We do have two notes that were sent in by neighbors. One from Scott Spiewak, who gives his uh, address as a P.O. box. But he says that he, oh, he lives next door at 232. And he's in support of the appeal. We also have a letter from an email from Jemmy Broussard, who is at 233 South Street, diagonally across the street from the residents, and they are in support. They've seen the plans and have no objections. Any comments from code enforcement? Just um, you know, points of clarification here, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an in-law apartment, but by definition, it, it is an apartment. Um, use cannot be restricted to any period of time or any individual. So it, it would, you know, always be available for rental if the property sold. So I mean, it, it is an apartment. So, so if if the uh, Munnells put a breezeway between the house and the garage, would the whole thing be a moot point? No, um, two family homes um, are permitted in the, the district. Uh, detached, um, it, it attached has to be attached through habitable area for it to be a, what we call the accessory dwelling unit. So it has to have a common wall and it has to have a communicating door, as I said, through, through habitable area. Um, a standard duplex has to have you know, physical space yeah, a duplex could have a breezeway between them, I believe. But again, a duplex was not a permitted use in this location either. So, got it. Yep. But Craig, his the application talks about the accessory dwelling unit. Are we applying that that standard or or no? It's you no, know. no. Yeah, it's it, yeah, ir irrelevant um, due to the configuration here. So this is strictly a variance to allow a second dwelling, two unit. Um, dwelling on the property, a second detached dwelling, I should say. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, can I ask the applicant a question, Chris? Sure. So having, so I assume you thought about, there's no way to attach it through a, through a 
quote communicating wall is is put. There's there's no way for you, for you to make this a full attachment and, and avoid the the double dwelling problem. Are you speaking to me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it, the in order to do that, it, we we we've gone around this around. You know, we'd have to demolish the backyard and tear up all that stuff back there, and, and it kind of locks us in. Uh, we lose, you know, the the scenery back there. It's a beautiful sunset every night. We wouldn't we would have a hard time getting. We'd lose all our outdoor living area, you know, and, and have to rebuild a whole all that stuff, and it would kind of lock us in. You know, we will. Not, if you want to put a provision, I'll never, I'll never rent that place. We you can't know, yeah, that. that's the problem. This is just so. You know, we're hanging on this. You know, this is this guy needs a place to live. We got to. And and, and uh, just to be clear, I'm no way insinuating that you would. And I trust your you you to your word. I'm just saying that once it's existing, uh, if when you sell the house, the next people would have every right to rent it out. So. It's it's going to look. It's going to improve the neighborhood. It's going to look beautiful uh you know visually and um we're not going to do any drought you know it's going to look the same you know we're just trying to get the sky a place to live any other questions from the board i believe that concludes the public testimony i did i solicit testimony from foreign again i think you got two letters too yeah those i did read so we'll close the public testimony portion of the hearing. We have a request for an attachment of an ADU to the side of a garage rather than to a house, which makes it effectively a second dwelling. We've heard testimony that uh, there's no other good place to put it and that the function of it is uh, as an ADU rather than as a second home. Discussion. Laura. I was unfortunate enough to be involved in the ADU statute development. And my understanding of the purpose of the common wall on the door was really to make sure that the property owners sort of could keep a handle on what was going on in the ADU and it wouldn't get out of control. Um, it related primarily to our college towns um, and situations of over occupancy there. Here, although the ADU is not going to be attached to the home, it is attached to the garage, which is right next door to the home. And it does seem to me that it would be a hardship to have to destroy the back of the house and the sunroom and the patio to put the ADU there. I don't think it's gonna diminish surrounding property values. I don't think there's a benefit to the public from denying the variance. Um, whether or not it's attached to the house, it could be rented out in the future. So that's really sort of not an issue in my mind. Um, nor are the personal circumstances of the family, unfortunately, but given the uniqueness of the property and what's being requested, I would have no problem granting this variance. Yeah. Yeah, I also support it. Um, I also think that there's a lot of logic to ADUs being on the ground level. Um, so people aren't climbing up and downstairs above garages. So um, uh, for that reason and for what Laura outlined, I'm supporting, supportive of the uh, request. Andrew. You know, this is a really painful case for me because I, yeah, I, I completely accept everything that the applicant is saying. And um, yeah, I have no doubt in, in, in the most sincerest of intentions. I just have a really hard time approving a second dwelling that's completely detached. I think that's really out of the, the character. Um, and I think if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, the difference is that with an ADU, it could be rented out in the future, but it, it has to be owner occupied. Whereas here there'd be no restrictions on future use indefinitely for any future owners in the future could rent it out essentially as a second de a second detached dwelling and dwelling in very close you know proximity so i i have Andrew, a hard... yeah with an adu my understanding is that either the principal dwelling unit or the accessory dwelling unit has to be occupied by an owner but either or the one that's not can be rented out but perhaps i'm wrong craig no that is correct that's how uh, that was allowed 
um, through the RSA and we incorporated it in our ordinance. Oh, e one of the units has to be owner occupied. Correct. Right. Yes. Okay. But but that's for the ADU regulations. Right. The, the ADU right. regulations aren't applying to this property at all. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's senseless to make them try to tear down their, their patio and backyard. I mean, the only other option, if you want to have the common wall, is to tear tear down the garage, attach it there, then put a garage to the, the side of that. So I think that's that really creates an unreasonable hardship. I'm inclined to agree with my colleagues who are in favor of the appeal. I think looking at the uh, design, the building attached to the garage, there wouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind that that was an ADU, which means that from the point of view of the impact on the character of the neighborhood visually, there wouldn't be any. And I, I can't imagine uh, that anyone would con construe it as a second house on the property. So I, I don't, uh, I feel that from that point of view, it's inconsistent with the spirit of the, of the ordinance and the arrangement of things on the property has frequently been considered by the board to be a peculiar characteristic of the property that will justify uh, claiming a hardship. Would anyone care to make a motion? I move that we approve the variance. Is there a second? Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? We'll start the voting in that case with Ms. Spector Morgan. Aye. And Mr. Monahan. Yes. Mr. Winters. Nay. Did you say aye or nay? Nay. Nay. Uh, Mr. Walner. Aye. And I vote aye. The vote is four to one with Mr. Winters in the minority and the variance is granted. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Thanks so much. I, I, and and do I just? I'm sorry. Do I just? Do I do I get something? I'm not sure how. What yeah, the next? You'll get a letter. You, you, you'll you, get a you, notice you. of decision. <laughs> yeah, we will send you a notice of decision in the mail within in the next week. Um, and of course, there's a 30 day appeal period um, if anybody wishes to appeal the decision. So, thank you so much. I really thank you. Welcome. All right. The last case on the agenda this evening is case 1921, Michael and Jennifer Leon. If I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I apologize. The applicants wish to construct a 16 by 22 addition on the east side of an existing dwelling and request the following. A variance to Article 2841H, Table of Dimensional Regulations, to permit an 11 foot setback from the easterly property line where a 15 foot setback is required and a variance to Article 2841H Table of Dimensional Regulations to remit a total lot coverage not to exceed 51%, where a maximum lot coverage of 40% is allowed. This property is at 29 Wood Avenue in an RM residential medium density district. Where's Wood Avenue? Uh, it's in the South End, uh, right off Broadway, between Broadway and Bow Street. Right, thank uh -huh. you. And Mr. Leon, are you with us? I am. Can you hear Please me? Tell the truth. I do. And did I pronounce your name correctly? No, you did not. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's taken me. It's taken me uh, forty years to get to this. But if you put an L before the boy's name, Ian, Leon. Leon. Yep. Uh, at least that's what my father says. So. Well, your father wants um, to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. So here we go. I'll kind of take it away here. Um, just a little bit about myself first. I was uh, born in Concord in 1981. My parents bought this house you see on the screen share in 1983. Uh, so it was about one and a half when I moved in here. Um, and let's see, about five generations of South Enders in the family here. And uh, my parents, my sister-in-law and uh, my in-laws and all have homes within a, a block of this house here. Um, a little bit about the neighborhood. Many homes on Wood Ave uh, have been in, uh, owned their ham homes for several generations. Uh, the appearance, the quality, integrity of the neighborhood, incredibly important to me. Uh, my wife Jennifer and I take great pride in the curb appeal and condition of our home. 
Uh, it is extremely common for homes to have much smaller setbacks than our standard and smaller than I propose. Uh, only a few homes on the street meet standard setbacks. Many setback variances have been granted to the houses surrounding mine. Uh, so project scope is to uh, add a third bedroom to our two bedroom house. Uh, bedroom will have a master bath, two small closets. Uh, home addition will extend off the left from the street perspective and the post construction square footage will be about 1500 square feet. Uh, foundation will be full basement, uh, standard specifications there. And the new roof line will uh, tie into the existing gable and look natural to the home. Uh, so here we have a, a quick overlay. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, probably not. Um, so in yellow there, in, in Microsoft Paint with my great artistic capability, I give you just a, a brief idea of, of where the addition is going to go. Um, but I guess the reason I pull up this photo is just to kind of look at some of the surrounding homes on the street. Um, so I'm at 29 there and Wood Ave is uh, just to the north as you see. Uh, if you go to 31 Wood Ave, you'll notice on both sides of that house, the setbacks are uh, anywhere between seven and 11 feet. Uh, if we keep going down the street to 33, uh, we see about a four foot setback there. And the, uh, the part that's uh, uh, abutting that four foot setback is actually an addition itself. That's a great room addition that was put on about uh, 20 odd years ago. Uh, directly to the rear of my home um, on Hope Ave, uh, the property has actually has two dwellings. Uh, the, the main dwelling is only a few feet from the property line, but the secondary dwelling, which is a two-story, two-bedroom, uh, is about 18 inches from the property line. Uh, and as we work our way down the street, we see that with uh, that larger property that uh, has a barn there very close to the, uh, to the property line, although it's not a dwelling. If you look next to it, to the left at their dwelling, that four-season porch uh, that was installed within the last several years was also granted a variance for there. And uh, again, on would have uh, many more examples of this. If you zoom out on this photo, which I, I don't have, this was sent to me by one of your colleagues. Uh, you can see example after example of this over and over again. Uh, so this is the initial drawing that I sent over uh, for my building permit. Um, you see the two bedrooms in the rear of the home, which are the, the two that exist now. And then off to the left there, there's a master bedroom, uh, which is just a couple of feet or one foot internally larger than the existing bedroom. So not too much larger or slightly, slightly larger master with a three quarter bath and a couple of closets there. Uh, something I just want to point out about this photo or this drawing is that my setback, as you see on, on the left there, I've measured a, an 11 feet, which is what is in the variance requests. Uh, it's really about 12 feet, maybe 12 and a half feet. I'm not interested in paying a surveyor to, to come out. Uh, so I wanted to err on the side of caution here. Um, so so that's what's in the paperwork, but the setback is a little, it's a little larger than that in all honesty. Um, so this was sent to me again by one of the folks down at the city, I think Dave Hall, just kind of an overview here. Um, and so the reason I added this is if you look down, uh, kind of south in the photo anyways, uh, you'll see that the, the overlay is, uh, puts the, the stone retaining wall on my property. And I know this isn't an official survey, but it's the only reference I have. So uh, the, the only reason I, I'll point that out is to, uh, to get here. So uh, when I measure my 11 feet, I'm measuring about where the fence post is. Uh, however, uh, I actually own over, over to the wall there. So that's why I'm saying this actually a little bit more than uh, the, the variance requested on the property. Uh, so a quick little mock up here uh, from an architect downtown that's been working on this. Uh, on the top here, you see where the addition is. However, that's set back about 30 feet from the front of the home. On the bottom photo, you can see where it actually ties in um, to the rear. And it's just that, um, that smaller gable that would protrude. The, the front roof line would look absolutely original to the home, uh, would tie into the existing gable and side porch of the home. So it would make no difference to the roof line. It would just extend the existing roof line uh, about 16 feet. Uh, here you see the where the two properties come together. Um, I don't know if it's really possible to see it, but in the photo, 
uh, about halfway through that section of fence, there is a, a grade stake in the ground. It's, it's kind of blurry to see there. Um, so you can see there's a good 12 feet to the property line. And then on the other side in the neighbor's property there, uh, the Murphy's house, uh, they, they have about 25 feet till they get to their house. And that, that garage they have there is actually further back than what the new, uh, addition would be. So they, they don't actually line up together. They'd, they'd be diagonally from one another about 30 feet apart. Uh, so there is another element of this besides the 11 or 12 foot setback. Uh, the variance is going to require increase in lot coverage. Um, in this zone, I think I'm an RM, 40% is uh, the maximum lot occupancy. Uh, from what I can tell from research, lot occupancy is largely about neighborhood den density and consistency, open air space. Uh, there's also uh, in, certainly some information about, in there about water drainage. Um, I, I'll be 11% over that 40. My in-ground swimming pool occupy 14% of the lot. So uh, it's flush to the ground. Uh, most people don't know that it's there because I need to have a, a six foot tall fence around the pool. It's a privacy fence around the backyard. So uh, I don't see, uh, certainly for the, the uh, neighborhood density aspect of this, I don't see there being uh, any issue with my lot coverage because 14% of the lot isn't it isn't a structure. It's not raised above ground and it's not noticed by the neighbors. Um, you know, there is there is that water drainage aspect. I'll say, um, you know, the first thing I notice about that is if I go a couple streets away, this percentage goes up and up and down. And, you know, on Stone Street, it's 50%. On Allison Street, it's about 60. And it, as you head downtown, it's around 80 so although I know the drainage is necessary, if, if the ordinance were just about drainage, that, that number wouldn't be a variable. It'd be pretty consistent. Um, that said, I happen to be lucky in my situation. What have is a nice pitch in the middle of the road, and, and my property was about where that pitch was adjusted. So I have a, a berm around three sides of my property that's about 18 inches tall. Uh, so as you see here, uh, there's a grade in the grass anyways that works down toward the road. And my iPhone doesn't take great pictures, but as you get about a foot from the road there, it drops off about 18 inches all the way around from the front to the side. And even in the rear of the lot, uh, there's about a 10 inch drop off. Uh, so there's never been water drainage issues here. Um, because of this berm, my, my foundation's actually uh, a foot or two higher than most of the homes on the street. Uh, so there's certainly no basement water issues and, and there's no pooling in neighborhood yards or anything like that because of the uh, the brilliant structure of those who created this road probably a hundred years ago. Um, neighborhood impact, the addition will not change the view, access, or general aesthetic of the area. The addition will follow existing roof line and look natural to the original home. Uh, bringing my home up to a three bedroom will increase the value and square footage of the home, making it more comparable to others on the street, thus improving the neighborhood consistency and value. Most of the homes on whatever, at least three, some are four and five bedroom. Uh, and then there's a couple smaller two bedroom homes. Uh, the addition will be toward the rear home. The curb appeal of the house will be virtually unaltered. Uh, and why? Uh, we love this home like a part of our family. I grew up here. I moved in here when I was about a year and a half old. It would be very sad to leave. Uh, as my daughters grow, we will need more space for them to live, study, feel comfortable. Uh, at home into their college years and beyond. Uh, my wife and I both have hybrid work jobs uh, where we require office space at home. Um, and certainly we're planning on elder care in the next several years as all the grandparents live within a block or two of us. So there's many needs to uh, beyond just a bedroom to bring this home above 1100 square feet. Um, but certainly uh, at the time, It'll be used for my children as they go into middle school and high school and, and beyond. So, um, without approval, we'll be forced to leave a home. My family has been in for three generations to fit a growing family with space needs for the present and the future. Moving will take us away from our neighboring families. We have designed the family's geographical structure to provide convenient care for children and elders as time goes on. There are virtually no homes available on the market and not being able to make alterations to the property would unnecessarily saddle me with family, financial, and long-term logistical hardships. Uh, if this variance is approved, I will have the space to keep the home and my family for more generations to come. It is truly my desire to hand over this house to my children someday, uh, but without enough space to get them through their teens and 20s and to care for aging family members, we will need to move. 
Uh, the proposed project will look natural to the home and not impact any existing views, land use, or neighborhood density. I have the approval and support of all my direct neighbors. Uh, my wife and I take great care and pride in the home. Uh, and this addition will be no different. Uh, the, the last element of this for me is a bit of an elephant in the room. And uh, that is that I was granted a permit by the city of Concord about three and a half months ago or three months ago. Uh, I sent in that drawing that I showed you early on in the presentation and uh, some questions went back and forth and uh, I was granted the permit. I came in the mail and I paid for it. And after financing the project and hiring contractors, the building inspector came by and noticed that he had made an oversight on my setback. Um, and so now I'm happy to be here with you all at the zoning meeting, but uh, I would have rather had come here before all these logistics had been put into play and um, I had leveraged my future for this project. So uh, I understand that those things are not considerations in this process, but certainly uh, I hope there's a little empathy available somewhere. And that is the duration of my screening tonight. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Lee, is this currently a two bedroom home? It is, yes. Is that uh, characteristic of the neighborhood, two bedroom homes? No, uh, not particularly. I mean, there's a couple on the street, but there's three bedroom, four bedroom, and five bedroom homes on the street as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Did Craig just put up the the satellite view if you have it handy? There you go. Do you need the uh, what the aerials on too? Let's see, twenty nine. So this this is the property right here, the okay. center of the screen. Yeah. And then I can put on the aerials also. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And then I have another view of it here too. So okay. this is... Jeez, Craig, that's from before I painted. You gonna put something <laughs> new over there? You must have just painted it because these are Last supposedly summer. 2020. Yeah, these That's would have been. I like the blue just, better. <laughs> just before the painting. Well, yeah, I, I do too. I had to convince my mother that it was a good idea, though. She was quite particular. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Very good. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Is there anyone here who wishes to be heard in favor of this appeal? Is there anyone who wishes to be heard in opposition? I do have a couple of emails. Uh, one is from Judith Bryant. He, she lives at 28 Wood Ave, and which is across the street and has no objection to the appeal. And uh, another one is from Sarah and Gabriel Cohen who live at Well Wood Ave. Uh, their house is diagonal from the Lyons house. Yeah, the numbering, no the numbering's all messed up there, Chris. The, the, that house is pretty much across the street. Just so, you, just so you know that 12 is almost right across the street from 29. Okay. Uh, the, they have no objection to the addition construction and support the requested variances. Any comments from code enforcement? And I do have one uh, more letter that came in via email late today. Um, it is from uh, Brian and Heather Smith. They reside at 11 Wood Avenue and they are expressing their support for the requested variance at 29 Wood Avenue. Other than that, no, I don't have anything um, additional to add unless you have specific questions. Thank you very much. With that, we'll close the public testimony portion of the hearing. We've heard testimony that uh, the uh, size and configuration of the lot requires that an addition be um, um, within the setbacks. And we have also heard testimony that this is the only way a third bedroom can be added to the building. Discussion, shall we start this one off with Mr. Walner? Thank you. Um, I think um, 
a three bedroom house is a, a reasonable uh, home to have in, in that neighborhood. Uh, certainly we heard testimony to the fact that that was certainly the characteristic of the neighborhood. Um, there's no place to put this. Um, I think he's uh, entitled to have um, a third bedroom. And I think that the encroachment on the setback is minimal. Mr. Winters. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it's a very small lot. I mean, if you look at that map, almost every house on in that area is 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 in the setback because those lots were you know designed for houses that were much smaller and they've obviously in, in increased with size as, as living standards have increased so i think that he, he still didn't have a, a relatively small house compared to most of the others on the neighborhood I, I think it's pretty modest expansion and and i i, I think it's a reasonable use mr monahan yeah, I'm going to support it. I think the, um, uh, the setback issue is fine. I do think we're creating a pretty overcrowded piece of um, property here by going up to 51% lot coverage. Um, but I don't. I also know that it's not totally. It's it's a kind of a dense neighborhood. So um, I guess I'll go along with it. Ms. Spector Morgan. I agree with what everyone else said. As do I. Is anyone interested in making a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? In that case, I will poll the board. Ms. Spector Morgan. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Mr. Winters. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The variances are granted. And I believe that concludes our agenda for this evening. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes from last month's meeting? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Is everyone in favor? I'm going to abstain because I wasn't there. Okay. I'll vote aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Mr. Winters? Aye. And Mr. Waller? Aye. The minutes have been blessed. Is there any other business to come before us this evening? Craig? Uh, no, I don't have anything on uh, the agenda, so that's it for me. I will bid you all a fond farewell. Happy birthday, Chris. Happy Thank birthday. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> now you're a septuagenarian. Uh, yeah, septuagenarian. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> is this well, the first election? Is those are old guys. <laughs> is this the first time your birthday has been celebrated at the ZBA? Uh, well, it isn't actually today. Oh, okay. All right. uh, it was it was March tenth. Now you know your wife uh, orchestrated. Yes. A, a, a windfall of cars to be mailed to her. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, it was it was quite a performance. I wound up with a trailer truck backing up from the post office, <laughs> up in a couple of yards on the lawn, and it was fun to see all the cards. Thanks, everybody. See you next month. Very good. Thank you. Care. Bye. Bye.